Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back on the neonatal cilia lectures. We're going to talk about gastrointestinal reflux and gastrointestinal reflux disease, one of the most important topics in the GI and one of the most commonly um, clinical practice or GI practice that we fix in the NICU, um, the most challenging topic or GI topics in the NICU. So again, my name is Dr. Ben Ayad. I'm one of the neonatologists at the Mercy Health Jovan Bay Hospital, clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois. Um, we're gonna talk about what the difference between gastroflux and gastroflux disease. Before we start, uh, just a reminder, um, if you like this presentation, feel free to subscribe me and then every new lecture you're gonna receive it and also click on the notification so you can receive my updated lectures. So before we go further, we can mention some definition is for important, universal. You're gonna hear about GER or gastrointestinal reflux. What the difference between GER and GERD? The GER refer to the effortless retrograde. So any retrograde movement of the milk or any gastric content, doesn't have to be milk, gastric content into the esophagus or all the way to the oral pharynx with or without regurgitation or vomiting. So just retrograde movement of the gastric content into the esophagus or the oral pharynx that's called GER. It can be associated with regurgitations, which is a faultless retrograde or vomiting, which is forcible explosion of the abdominal content, okay? GER is a pathological condition with a sequence of GER. So whenever the, if the baby normal, all, almost all babies, they will have some degree of the GER. When the condition get worse to they become diseased, that's what we called GERD. There's something called refractory GERD. It's GERD that not responding to optimal treatment after four to eight weeks, usually after eight weeks of treatment, if not responding, that's what we called refractory GERD, okay? Let's talk about pathophysiology. Why some babies, they have more likely to have a reflux or why in general babies, they have a reflux. Premature more likely to have a reflux than older infant than adult. To answer this, we need to understand something called lower esophageal sphincter. It's not true sphincter though. It's multiple factors, physiological and anatomical component that make what we call sphincters. What are the factors? Number one, intra-abdominal esophagus. Number two, the angle, the way the angle called angle of head between the esophagus and stomach. Number three, the muscle or the junction, the gastroesophageal junction. Number four, the diaphragm or diaphragmatic cura. So let's talk one by one. So what does mean, or how important look intra-abdominal esophagus in creating lower sea sphincter. Location or the portion of the esophagus inside the stomach, under it's under the abdominal pressure. So more lengthy inside the stomach, more, or inside the abdomen, more you're gonna have resistance. And that's what the Basler equation said. So what does it mean? The length, the length, it's reversal. Let me write it down. The length with the pressure. There is direct relationship between length of the pressure. More lengthy inside the abdomen, more you're going to have the pressure or resistance. Okay? So that's number one. So that once once the, the lengthy of the portion of the esophagus inside the stomach create kind of like that, pressure or just being located inside the abdomen it's the affected by the intra-abdominal or positive pressure inside the abdomen that's number one number two the acute angle between the esophagus and gastric content that, that's the called acute angle that's at the lenti when you come with the acute angle create a lenti and that's increase the distance and farther the distance inside the abdomen is more is pressure. The third, the circumferential muscle at the lower sphere sphincter or at the junction, consider is the dependent factor. 
And finally, the diaphragm. So during the inspiration, the diaphragmatic cura pinch in, and that's create kind of like that, adding another anti-reflex mechanism. Okay, adding the pressure, lowering, and that's narrowing the sphincter and create kind of like that, additional factors help to prevent the reflux. So then the question is why premature baby, they are more likely to have gastric reflux. Number one, it's babies premature, they have transient lower estrogeal component or the sphincters. More premature, more likely to have the reflux. Number two, the immature esophageal motility and bore coordination associated with prematurity. Number three, the lower or slower gastric empty time. The gastric empty time in premature, it's more slower, okay? So that's remain the milk more and that's retrograde furthermore. On top of that, premature babies, usually they have more conditions adding on. Number one, babies premature more likely to have the feeding tube. The feeding tube that's dilate your sphincters because of tube and you have the feeding tube. So you create more opening. You leave the, the sphincters open. That's number one. And usually all babies less than 33 weeks, usually we place baby on the feeding tube until they have they show the coordination, the oropharyngeal or the, the breath swallow coordination. Second, premature baby, they are on caffeine. Any baby less than 32 weeks, you, almost all they place on caffeine. Caffeine itself lowers lower gastro or gastrogeal sphincters. Premature baby, they are more likely to have some respiratory component. They are more likely to have to be placed on non-invasive respiratory support, and that's increased intra-abdominal than the intrathoracic pressure. And that's kind of retrograde the, the all gastric content to the esophagus or oropharynx. So we understand now why premature babies, they have more likely to have reflux. Number one, we said the lower serious sphincters are immature or relax or transit relaxation of the lower serious sphincters. Number two, the immotility or immature gastric motility and bore coordination, which is associated with premature baby. Number three, the slower gastric empty time. Number four, adding factors, baby is more likely to have respiratory distress. Baby, they have feeding tube. Baby on caffeine. Additional factors, babies usually they have some premature, they're more likely to have some uh, at risk, lower premature baby, more risk at lower or neuro um, developmental disorders. Babies, in NICU more likely to have the, or at risk of the neonatal sepsis. Sepsis make baby more uh, hypotonic or they are uh, suppressed or the uh, effect on the motility. Uh, babies, congenital anomalies, they are more likely or additional risk, fa consider additional risk factors. Other risk factors that I did not discuss, if the baby uh, history of ECMO, if there's baby high VH or the neurological impairment and um, history of the perinatal depression if the baby had birth asphyxia um, on the cooling. As we said earlier, almost all premature babies, almost all, 100 births of premature baby, as you can see here, they have reflux, GER. I'm not talking about GER, I'm talking about GER. Half of the full-term baby, healthy full-term baby, they will have some degree of that GER. The difference is, is the severity or the degree of the reflux, how bad the reflux is. So uh, that's, I'm talking about now the GERD. Relevant to the GERD, it's only six to seven percent of the term baby, they will have the severe enough knee treated called GERD. And in premature baby, we said almost all, they have some degree of the GERD or they have the GERD. Only three to 10 percent of premature baby less than 1500, they will have the GERD. That means pathological GERD, okay? What's the factors determine the severity of the GERD? Number one, the quality or the degree of the acidity. More acid, more likely to have symptoms. Number two, the quantity of the reflux, how often. Number three, the potential injury to the esophageal mucosa. 
how usually they present. As I said, we're gonna talk about GER first. Usually GER, they present it with spit up or the emesis. And sometimes this is the only symptoms. Some other, or some kids, they might present it with irritability, more during feed, sometimes bradycardia or DSAT or feeding intolerance. We will talk about DSATs and bradycardia, whether it's significant enough or whether the GER is, is true, cause those symptoms or not, later on. Some babies, they can present with brewy, which is brief, resolve, unexplained events. When the baby presented with uh, brewy, usually we admit the baby, evaluate for the seizures, evaluate for the infection, but also we can evaluate also for the girth, for the flux. Although it's rarely established the certainty that reflux can cause brewy. Back to the relationship between apnea, brady descents with the girl. It's a lot of time we blame the, the events or brady descents, apnea. We mentioned that this is most likely related to the girl, but really it's the, the evidence does not support that girl can be triggered for apnea. That's very important. So if you see it in the board, all was wrong, okay? So what's the symptoms and sign of the GERD? Number one, irritability, discomfort, sometimes weight growth. So if baby has the, after you rule out other causes, if you think that the GERD enough to cause failure to thrive, then you can call it GERD. If baby severe enough to refuse a feed, and sometimes it can cause later on a virgin, then it might be, we can call it as a GERD. Some symptoms they might present it with arching, and that's very common in the NICU. Babies, they might present with irritability, and they will say that baby has arching all the way in the back, okay? That's called Sendifer sign. In older kids, they might present it with uh, heartburn, chest pain, um, very, very, very rare hematemesis, although it's hematemesis might consider as a red flag, so you have to rule out the other causes. It's very, very rare. They might present it with the wheeze, recurrent wheeze, or uh, they very, very, very rare. And always, if you present it with a strider, you need to rule out the other cause before you point your finger toward, because very, very, very rare uh, they can present it, but uh, always leave it in the very bottom, bottom under your differential diagnosis. We mentioned about red flag signs that keep an eye. So if you see those red flags, that means very unlikely to be GERD. Regurgitation started less than two weeks of life or more than six months or persistent after 18 months of life. If you have a bilious vomiting or persistent vomiting, usually it's not GERD. Chronic bloody stool or bloody diarrhea, nope. Hematemesis, dysuria, seizures, dysphagia, recurrent pneumonia, when you see those, it's the red flag for other pathology rather than GERD. How we diagnose GERD or GERD? Usually there's no gold standard diagnostic tools that we use. We rely mostly on the clinical suspicious history, 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 and whether baby respond to the non-pharmacological therapy before we, and very, very rare, they require pharmacological trial, especially in older kids. The, the, the very rare we use in the little ones, the older kids, they might give trial of four to eight weeks, we will discuss later on. So there's no gold standard diagnostic tools, but what we have, before we go further, what we have, let's review these very good articles that published 2019 about diagnostic and management gastric flux disease in infant and children. They reported two good algorithms that a lot of physicians they follow. That's not based on the evidence, but more based on the uh, expertise opinion. So if you take a history, a good history, physical exam, you look at the alarm sign. There is no alarm sign. Then number one key is the avoid overfeeding. 
we will discuss about management. Avoid overfeeding, small frequent feed. You might change the duration. We will discuss further. If the baby on formula, you might thick the formula. Baby on breastfeed, you recommend always continue breastfeed. If it's not improved, then so you maximize the formula or the breast milk duration, frequency, decrease overfeeding, small frequent feed. If it does not improve, then you might worth it to try two to four weeks in those babies on the formula, switch it to the hydrolyzed formula because sometimes, especially I'm talking about infant age group, sometimes you have overlapped symptoms. So before you consider treated with anti-reflux medication, you try Elementum um, or the um, either Elementum or the Nutramagen or we call it hydrolyzed formula. So milk, we have full regular milk. We have breakdown, slightly breakdown, we call it hydrolyzed formula, multiple companies. The most commonly used in the United States is the uh, Elementum or Nutramagen. If, it, if we are highly suspicious of cow milk protein allergy, despite switching to the hydrolyzed formula and the baby is not responding, then you might try farther down to the elemental formula, which is the, we have a new Kate or the Elicare, which is amino acid-based formula. If it does not improve, then at this point, feel free to refer to the GI uh, and trial of the anti or acid suppression medication. Okay, so that's the protocol for the infant who's less than a year. In older kids, they have a different protocol or different trial. History, physical exam, any alarming sign, always look for the alarming features. If there's no parents, child education, lifestyle modification, if it's not improved, then you might consider acid suppression medication up to the eight weeks. If it's not improved, then you refer to the GI for further workup, okay? And since my lecture is about infancy, then uh, feel free you guys read this um, article. It's very important, very good article to read. Okay, let's talk about the diagnostic approach, what we have available so far. Although we said there's no golden uh, standard diagnostic tools. Number one, you will hear about, or you might hear about esophageal pH prop. So GLB, it's a prop, uh, not widely used nowadays. It's prop placed on the or or trans or inter, or transnasal prop, usually located in the lower esophageal sphincter, as you can see, and you confirm it by the X-ray. You leave it for 24 hours. During that time, you measure the number of the acid reflux, the duration of those episodes. And overall, the proportion of time where the pH is less than four, it's very important. Why? Because widely we use the something called the reflux index, which is summation of the, the period of time where the pH less than four. And if you have the reflux index more than 7% of time, where's the pH more than uh, less than four, it's more acidic, that means it's acidic, then we consider as abnormal. If it's at the three to seven percent, then N determined. If less than three, it's normal. Okay, again, it's a probe through the nose, located at lower sphere sphincters, only measure lower third of the esophagus, only measure the pH, the duration of time, and then we calculate something called the reflux index. Is that clear? Very good. When we use this one, if we don't have the second diagnostic approach, which is the multi-channel interluminal impedance. So if you don't have it in your center and you want to determine the patient have a lot of symptoms, you think is related to the reflux, troubles some symptoms, but you think that I could be GERD, or you start medication and you need to see the effect of medication, then you can use, it. and that's based on the expert opinion to use, only if you don't have the multi-channel, okay? The limitation of the pH probe 
used in the infant, especially in the premature babies, because majority of time, the stomach rarely below four. The stomach pH is rarely below four. Number two, what's interesting that abnormal esophagus pH or the, the, the probe does not correlate with the severity of symptoms. The patient has the end of symptoms, like in GL pH, you go like pH normal. Or the patient has the end of pH acidic, the patient does not complain anything or doesn't have any events, whereas DSAT or arching. Okay, so there's no correlation. Very good, excellent. Let's talk about what's the multi channel intraluminal impedance. It's considered the best test so far available to diagnose GERD or GERD. Why it's important this test? Because it can measure acidic and non acidic reflux. Interestingly, it's not available, widely available in the United States. It's not all the centers they have it. Even not all the pediatric GI trained on that. So, uh, so it's not all pediatric GI trained on the interluminal impedance multi-channel, and it's not available, widely available in the United States, in all centers. Okay. Important that the difference between the impedance and the, the BH probe, BH probe measure only acidic. This one can measure acidic and non-acidic reflux. So can detect the movement of the fluid, or solid or air in the esophagus. So this is the BH probe alone, and this is the BH probe with, or the, this is multi uh, impedance, esophageal impedance monitor with multiple channels. And the channels is important to measure the movement of the fluid solid or air in the esophagus. Also, whether those fluid go anti-grade or retrograde, and then also measure the pH of the those fluid. Is it acidic, less than four? Is it the weak alkali, weak acidic or alkaline reflux? Lobes uh, and his group, they, uh, they measure 26 babies, preterm baby. They used 24 hour uh, multi channel impedance in those 26 babies who are less than 32 weeks. And interestingly, they note that 25% of time they were acidic reflux. Majority, they were weak acidic or non acidic reflux. So the pH higher than four, they found it almost in 70% of recording time. 70% of recording time, they were pH more than four. So what's the limitation of esophageal impedance? The limitation of the esophageal impedance, number one, as I said, is not widely available in all medical centers, even in the United States. Number two, lack of the true control patient. Also, it might alert the clinician about presence of esophagitis, but does not tell us exactly whether this baby need endoscopy or no. That's very important. More important than this, almost more than 50% of, uh, or more uh, the parents fail to report more than 50% of symptoms. So there is no correlation between the, the result and the symptoms. A lot of time, the baby have a, a, a significant reflux and the patient does not report any symptoms. Okay? Addition to that, the lack of the validated normal value standard in premature infant. So that's why there is a limitation the use of the estrogen impedance. And that's why not all the centers, they use it. But if they ask which one is the most reliable, that's the most reliable ones that we have so far. What about, about the other measurement or other procedures? Endoscopy and biopsy. Endoscopy and biopsy, we don't use, we don't use it routine. We use only if you think of other, if there's any red flag to rule out the other causes, like especially in older kids, if there's any, esophageal or the eosinophilic esophagitis, if the infectious esophagitis, or if they detected any 
other pathology like the strictures, uh, Barrett's esophagus. Okay, the issue that we face with the endoscopy and biopsy is that normal endoscopic can be normal despite the GERD. Baby has severe GERD when you go, it can be normal. And then absent, baby they have a GERD, they might have absent abnormal, normal appearance of from outside and even histologically they don't have anything uh, correlated with the GERD. So that's why it's not diagnostic tool in GERD. We use it if you are thinking of the red flag signs, or there's any other cause that you need to rule it out. So not to diagnose GERD, clear. What about the upper GI and swallow through? Again, is not supported, used as clinical practice to diagnose GERD. You cannot use it to diagnose just GERD. But you can use it if you think of the other causes, like if baby, you expect the baby has pathological conditions that might mimic the picture of the girl, like baby had hiatus hernia, if there's mal rotation, if the baby vomiting, persistent, you think of the bilirubin stenosis, although bilirubin stenosis can be easily diagnosed by the ultrasound and tetra. Okay, so to diagnose GERD, we, we don't use the upper GI solo study. Esophageal manometry also is not used in the GERD. It's considered the golden standard for the evaluate the esophageal mortality. Okay, but it's not supported and never been used for the GERD. The only use if you are expected mortality disorder. Gastric scintigraphy, again the same. Gastric is considered the golden starting for the evaluate the gastric empty. Only if you use it if you are think that the underlying cause related to the delay gastric empty time. Pathological conditions that trigger and can cause delay gastric empty time. Usually I give a dye, tectum, and then they measure with the timing. You can see one hour, two hour, four hour, and evaluate. Here you can see the abnormal go all the way back and that still remain is not empty. So that means baby has the delayed gastric empty time. But again, is not practical used, okay? And we need to use it when GERD symptoms are not responding to standard therapy and other diagnoses like delayed gastric empty can be triggered. And again, it shouldn't be used to diagnose GERD in children because lack of standardized technique and age specific normative, uh, a specific normal value limited. What about the trans bilorex? Sometimes we use the, especially in the chronic babies, chronic lung disease, if we think it could be baby has a bad reflux, that baby has small micro aspiration. Sometimes we, tr we try the approach and especially when I did my training, some center they use it. They try to approach of the trans bilorex feeding to reduce the reflux burden, which is to have a similar that way that you pass the gastric um, all the way to the trans pylorus. So, um, the, exactly the mechanism like fund duplication. And um, this maneuver, you cannot say, okay, and baby's no more vomiting, it's most likely baby has reflex or baby has reflex, let's do trans to diagnose, that doesn't work like this. So it's not the, the use, the use of trans does not, is not diagnostic tool uh, to diagnose. What about the proton bomb inhibitor for diagnosis of GERD? In older kids, they suggest you can use it trial of the proton bomb inhibitor, whether it's gonna help or no, four to eight weeks trial. But in the infant age group, multiple randomized control trial, they, contr they, they look at this way, they look at in the preterm and full term baby, they give trial of two to four weeks, and they found none of these trial reduce the symptoms uh, over the placebo, regardless the length of the therapy or regardless the, uh, the trial length. So what does it mean is because the B, we said the majority or more than 70% of the time reflux has BH more than four. So that means it's the more likely either weak acid or alkaline. So that means the use of the proton bomb inhibitor in infant does not gonna resolve the symptoms. And that's supported by randomized controlled trial. So there's no evidence supported.
What about biomarkers? Also biomarkers like pepsin. Pepsin, as we know, it's the enzyme, break down the protein to the more, break it down to the trip, uh, polypeptide and then trypsin to the peptides and then peptidase to the amino acid. People, they look at the pepsin uh, enzyme in the, either in the buccal mucosa or in the, uh, to the, when you do endoscopy, uh, to look at the lung, if there's any microaspiration, they found overall is the, when they swab the babies in the mouth, they found positive in almost one third of the controlled patients. So that's not um, an overall in the study, the sensitivity around of this trial or the look at the pepsin around 72% with the positive predict value only 58%. Let's talk about now, management, how we treat. Let's assume that you have a baby who's um, arching, um, failure to thrive, or have severe symptoms, uh, multiple split up, DSATs, Brady. You think that it might be reflux related uh, issues or the GERD disease. GERD, we don't treat. Okay, if just split up, don't worry. Just um, don't, we don't treat. And if you, the, 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 the minimum you can do just you can conservative non pharmacological intervention, which is the very benign, you can use it for all those concerning uh, babies. The most important is that feeding changes. General recommendation is in outside the feeding, it's that always if the uh, avoid, especially for the burns, avoid to back smoke as a trigger. Okay, and always breastfeed over formula feed. That's the general rules. Okay, let's talk about the feeding strategy. The recommendation is that we said the most common is the cause is the overfeeding. When so the, the, the strategy that we use is the small, more frequent feed. People they look at, okay, um, and that's the one trial, they look at the feeding every one hour. Maybe that usually we feed every three hours. So if the baby has a reflux, bad reflux, and this baby shows symptoms that concern for GERD, so let's um, they try to feed the baby every hour instead of two to three hours. This, in one study by the Omari, uh, reported that this way it can decrease the total GERD episodes, but the interesting, the more they found the more frequent acidic reflux episodes, those over hourly feed or the every hour instead of the two to three hours. In my center, what we do, this second trial, which is the, uh, they look at, okay, if baby has a reflux, what we do, we feed every three hours, usually running over uh, 20 to 30 minutes. We expand or slower the duration of feed over 45 minutes or 60 minutes, sometimes even 90 minutes or 120. Uh, and this study, they look at not only the symptoms, also they measure the multi-channels and BH study uh, for those baby who slower the feeding. They found that slower the feed can decrease the girl's symptoms or they've shared with the fewer girl reflex or events, but those when you, when you, when you feed over slower duration, so instead of running over polos feed, you, you slower the duration, then you might compromise the nutrition, especially fat loss. And more if you keep it continuous feed. But unfortunately, some babies, we have to, if we have to, we have to, okay? It's very, very rare conditions. There's any randomized trials compared continuous versus bolus? The answer is no. There's no randomized controlled trials compared continuous feed versus bolus feed on the GERD patient, okay? So that's number one, change the practice or feeding protocol. I'm talking mainly in the NICU here. Most of our baby on the NICU, they are on the feeding tube. And those in the feeding tube, usually they are on the scheduled feed every three hours or two to three hours. So if it's every three hours, you break it every two hours. Um, if they are not improved, then you say, okay, do you know what? Let's slow down. And that's what widely used practice. Slow down the duration of feed instead of running over 30 minutes or the like bolus feed, you break it down or you slow down to the 45 or even 60, sometimes it's even longer, okay? But always keep in mind, if you're doing this way, you might compromise with the baby's nutrition. What about the thickness feeding? We have a couple of the uh, way. 
either well prepared formula, thickness formula, that's we have the AR milk or the Similex spit up formula, which is thickness formula, usually uh, like liquid when the baby swallow, when the moment that they touch pH, changing become more like thick. In older kids, you can mix with either rice cereal or the oatmeal cereal or the exanting gum. Let's talk about each one. Exanting gum, people, they try to away from it. Why? Because it's linked to the necrotizing enterocolitis in both preterm baby and formal or term baby who's at risk. So that's why the recommendation is not used for the preterm or formal preterm up to one year of age. Okay, by adding the Xantan gum or similar thickener. And that's published in the 2012. We discussed about will prepared formula. It's already will form it. AR milk or the Similex spit up. The AR milk by the Infamil company and the spit up by the Similex. Um, it's usually thick when touch acidification. And that's why we, they, uh, they are not recommended to mix with the mom's breast milk because the mom's milk can might hydrolyze the component of this formula. So uh, we don't give it together. It's not like, okay, keep mom's milk, mix it with uh, thickener or the AR milk, doesn't work, okay? Uh, those babies on formula already, you can switch it. If the baby is breast milk, that's a different treatment. We will talk about it. I'm talking here about if the baby on the formula, then you might try especially full-term baby or late preterm baby, 35, 36 weeks. Okay, a systemic review randomized controlled trial of thickness formula in term infant with GER conclude the use of the, this formula reduced the episodes of the regurgitation, but ineffective in reducing the acid reflux. So it might resolve the symptoms and what we see it, when we use it, babies have less symptoms, but when they measure, they found it's not reducing the acid reflux. If it's related to the acidity, it's not gonna reduce, okay? And no one assessed the, the effect of thickness formula on girl-related symptoms. Let's talk about if you decided to, especially in older kids or older infant, if you decided to mix the milk with oatmeal, or rice cereal. Rice cereal is not preferred anymore because in the 2020, the FDA published that pre-mix formula thickened with the rice, they increase the risk of the arsenic. And the arsenic, as we know, has long-term neurotoxicity uh, and cancer risk, okay? So we prefer not to use the rice, uh, but if you decided to use the cereal, use the oatmeal cereal. The oatmeal cereal usually one spoon, if you mix one spoon with the one ounces, that's you increase your calorie up to the 34 calories. So usually the milk is the 20 calories. If you use one ounces, bear one scoop, that's increase your calorie to the 34 calories. If you use the two ounces in one scoop, you increase it to the 27 calories. So why it's important, that means when you decided, if you decided to use the oatmeal formula or oatmeal, um, mix with the formula, then it's very important to measure the baby weight and follow those cases for excessive weight loss. Oh, sorry, excessive weight gain. Also for those babies less than four months, you need to watch for malabsorption. If the baby has abdominal distension, like gassy a lot, he's not absorbing the malabsorption sign and symptoms, then you might think that baby is not absorbing the starch they have starch indigestion because the pancreas is still immature if the baby is less than four months of age, okay? What about the positioning? I know uh, a lot of people, uh, we used to recommend the babies to be on the around 30 or 45 degree, um, leave it the bit up. That's no longer recommended. Browning also position, although it's very helpful, it's no longer recommended, okay? So BB, it's the, if you want to keep the baby upright, you can keep it for 20 to 30 minutes after feed, seem to reduce like hood for the regurgitation. 
but American Academy Pediatric and North American Society of the Pediatric Gastroenterologist, they recommend all babies or all infants younger than 12, they should place on the subine for safety because of the risk of the sudden infant death syndrome higher than the benefit treatment from the browning position on the reflex. Okay, so that's why um, almost uh, a lot of the NICU, they don't recommend it at all and uh, safety baby bit and they like the baby to be on the prone position no matter what. Also lateral positioning, that's not recommended to treat a reflux infant because of the SIDS or the sudden infant death syndrome risk. Okay, so you did this, so baby has a reflux, you decided to uh, do the non-pharmacological treatment, you decided to do more frequent, you increase the duration, baby still uh, have a symptoms and enough you to point that you need to continue managing that approach. In this case, you might consider, so we are here, you might consider two to four weeks. So let's discuss about it. If the baby is on the breastfeed, okay? The best approach, if the baby on the breast milk, which is very rare, the mom still bumping and give the baby a bottle instead of breast milk uh, or instead of breastfeed, if the baby is doing this way, so we recommend the babies to be on the breast uh, because it's gonna come small, more frequent, okay? And usually they do very well. But if the baby on the breast milk and still uh, have a symptoms, then what we ask the mom to eliminate all the diary products because sometimes there is correlation or there's uh, ma the, the cow milk protein allergy, they can mask the symptom of the girl, can give you the girl like symptoms. So what we recommend to recommend mom to take eliminate all the milk di diary product and the soya. Okay, at least for the four weeks and see if the baby is improved or not. Okay, so that's if the baby on the breast milk or, or the breast milk or breastfeed. If the baby already in formula and you try thicken formula using AR milk or a spit up, you try to increase the duration, still baby has the symptoms, then you might consider switch it to the break down amino acid called hydrolyzed formula. We said that we have the whole milk, full amino acid, and then we have break it down, we call it hydrolyzed. And the most commonly formula we have the either elementum or nitromagen. If it doesn't work, then you, and you're still highly suspicious. So as I said, switch it to the hydrolyzed or hypoallergic formula. If it's still, you have strong suspicions that symptoms could be cow milk related, especially if they have family history, strong family history, um, a lot of abdominal distension, gas in the abdomen, bloody stool, uh, then you might consider trial of the elemental, which is amino acid-based formula. We have the Elicare or the, the commonly in the United States, Elicare or the uh, um, uh, care or uh, what other? I forgot that one I mentioned earlier, okay? Or new kit, yes, Elicare or new kit. Very good, okay. If the baby responds in any of these approach, then if the baby's on breastfeed uh, or breastfeed or breast milk, you ask mom, we said for two to four weeks, and then you might if improve, uh, you continue, and then you might reintroduce later on. But overall general rules, usually majority of those babies, they should maintain on the milk-free diet for at least one year until one year of age, okay? If you are not sure about that diagnosis, then you might, especially on those breast milk mom um, or babies, then you might uh, introduce the back to the, ask the mom to restart um, back her regular diet uh, after a few weeks. But overall, if that's the diagnosis, then usually need up to one year of age. Let's talk about if the baby is not responding despite trial of the hydrolyzed formula or hypoallergen formula, then unfortunately you need to refer to the GI or you can start trial of the uh, pharmacological therapy. Overall, we have the anti-acid, the over-counter 
medication that we use, but over counter is not recommended in the overall is not recommended, okay, in pediatric for treatment of the GERD. So overall is not recommended. But since we can mention very quick about what's the over counter, because that's sometimes uh, I usually cover both clinical and uh, for the board part. We have the aluminum hydroxide, we have the magnesium, or we have the calcium component, calcium carbonate. Uh, usually those used as a treat of acute, but is not for long-term use, okay? Uh, we have something called the sodium uh, alginate. Uh, that's usually um, combined with the sodium bicarb to reduce symptom of the GER. They work as a gastric barrier, as a physical barrier of the gastric mucosa, okay? It's the form as a viscous gel protect the causes a barrier on the, or form it a barrier on the gastric mucosa. When it's combined with the carbonate, and that's commonly used, we have the gaviscon, release the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide form, that efflux to the esophagus and also protect the esophagus from the erosion, okay, from the acidification. So it's really, it's more form of the viscous gas and the form that become when it's mixed with the uh, sodium bicarb, that form can go all the way up and protect your esophagus from the acidification. Not recommended, again, in the use of the GERD. It's not recommended. Long-term safety is not. There are some studies, small studies, they look at the use for premature baby, and they found that it reduced the number of the acidic uh, GERD episodes and total esophageal acid reflux. So it's work, although long-term safety, we don't have it. For the board, uh, several study linked the aluminum containing preparation when used for long term associated with the aluminum toxicity and complication. Calcium containing can increase the risk of the milky alkaline syndrome, which is triad of hypercalcemia, uh, alkalosis, and renal failure, high uric acid. So that's why the treatment in general is not recommended in babies who has a GERD, because usually the baby GERD they need for long term. What we have, we have the commonly is acid hydro or histamine to block receptor antagonist or proton bomb inhibitor. Overall, they have a limited roles in treatment on infant. I'm talking here about infant less than one year of age with regurgitation. We discuss why, because of the majority they have either weak acid or alkaline reflux. After uh, 2008, um, one study, they look at the, the, the at the time the infant used anti-acid at the time of the shard, they found up to the 25% uh, percent of the neonatal intensive care unit, they prescribed the anti-acid. American Academy of Pediatric targeted that decreasing the frequency of using anti-acid in the NICU. And that's the statement of the choose or choosing wisely in the neonatal medicine initiative. And uh, people in every conference, you will hear about it and you will, uh, there's topics that they focus on use gastrogeal reflux, gastrogeal reflux disease, use anti-acid uh, in, in the NICU. Um, and um, I believe since then the number, um, if, if another trial, you will see this less because we don't commonly now use anti-acid like before. Efficiency of acid suppression medication. Uh, as I said, it has low efficiency in treating of symptoms of GERD. Randomized control trial, they found no advantage over proton bomb inhibitor over placebo in treating GER. And that's based on multi uh, double blind randomized uh, placebo control. You need to know that both acid suppression, it's linked with the neck. And also in older children, proton bomb inhibitor increased risk of the bacterial overgrowth, gastroenteritis, commonly or community acquired pneumonia. And the reason for that, the acid, the rule of the acid as an innate immunity. So the stomach full of the acidity and that acid, it's killed the any microorganism coming from the mouth, okay? So when you suppress the acid, you have the access to enter of the bacteria. And that's the, explain the bacteria overgrowth, gastroenteritis and commonly acquired pneumonia. The advantage of H2 receptor, they have fewer side effects over the proton bomb inhibitor. In other hand, is less effective. 
okay? And in addition, their efficiency decreases with chronic use. So when it's used for more than or six months and above on the treatment, usually you need to go up in the dose because the efficacy becomes less and less. That's called tachy phylaxis. Histamine, it's the competitive inhibitor with the receptors. Proton bomb inhibitor inhibit hydrogen potassium ATPase, which inhibit the sodium uh, or the hydrogen chloride or the acid. Again, the uh, efficiency is not being established safety in premature babies. And people become less and less use of the H2 receptor antagonist. Number one, proton is more effective. Number two, simetidine. It's the linked increased risk of the liver disease. Gynecomastia, and there's some study that link it even in adults with increased risk of the cancer. That's why people, GI, BDS, GI, they become less use of the semitidine. If among those groups, they're going to use, they're going to use famotidine. Pepsin, okay? Broton bump inhibitor, as I said, inhibit potassium, uh, hydrogen potassium ATPase, but also it has side effect. Number one, short term acid rebound after stopping medication. Number two, increased risk of the diarrhea. Theoretically, in adult, there is theoretically concern about long-term use of the proton bomb inhibitor and osteoporosis. Think about it in premature babies at risk of osteopenia prematurity. Lenosprazole, it's linked with the concern of the an animal study it can cause heart valve injury in those infants less than one year, and has been based on the non-clinical study in the animal. What about the prokinetic agent? Is not recommended in premature in infant. Why? Because of the potential side effects. How it's work, the prokinetic? Usually it has two. Number one, increase the sphincter. Number two, increase gastric empty time. The commonly prokinetic that we have Plazil or metoclobramide. Sport question, usually questions, metoclobramide increased you work on the central dopamine antagonist, increased the risk of the tardive dyskinesia and extra pyramidal side effect. Also increase the potassium level can cause hyperkalemia and irritability. Dopamine local, non-central dopamine antagonist, they called domperidol, which is not FDA approved in the United States, but widely used in uh, Europe and Arab countries, can prolong, can cause prolonged QT interval and related drug interactions. Also, some few studies they might they they link it the dumbbell with the extra pyramidal side effect. Cisabride only in the you see it on, on the board. It's because it's removed from the market from the United States and Canada because it causes arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia, due to QT segment prolongation. The one widely used erythromycin, although it's linked to increase and proven it increase the risk of the bilaric stenosis and very rare can cause cardiac arrhythmia. Interestingly, is now in the Meta-analysis of 10 randomized controlled trials demonstrate no effective or no benefit of erythromycin as a brokinetic agent, and this published on the 2008 uh, Oncocron trials. Is that clear? So we have the acid suppression medication, rarely used in the NICU, only if we use it, we you can use by, by the neonatologist, but we prefer that the GI involved at this time. We have proton bomb inhibitor. They prefer over the H2 receptor antagonist because of the potential less efficiency and potential uh, side effect. Among the H2 receptor antagonist, the, the most commonly used is the uh, famotidine. What about the, what about the surgical use? We have the uh, surgical use, number one, um, it's not used of the, uh, we have the fund duplication, 
The fund duplication is not uh, commonly used nowadays. It's only in few conditions that you might consider use of the fund, uh, fund duplication. You use fund duplication when the, the patient had interactive or interactable or severe esophagitis or recurrent esophagitis. Consider fund duplication if the baby is confirmed to have pulmonary disease that it's related to the microaspiration. And you try all the other parameters and still baby had the reflux and you are sure that this is the approach, the best approach to decrease the reflux, then you might consider fund duplication. Fund duplication, as I said, is not widely used or not commonly nowadays because of the cautions. Number one, it's that the indication of the surgery has not been definitely established. Number two, failure rate, maybe they might have a symptom even after fund duplication. So that's called failure rate, it's, it widely varies. Complication is common. So that's why it's become less and less. Complication of the fund duplication, mainly small bowel obstructions. The other alternative, you might use the anti-reflux surgery, that transpyloric that we talk about it, or jejunal feeding, either through the feeding tube or the, through the feeding ostomy, or the, from the surgical placement of the jejunal feeding ostomy, which is the, through the bypassing the stomach. So few cases that the baby is chronic lung disease, they have microaspiration, those on the trach, um, and you still consider that each time you advance baby, baby uh, getting worse, then you might consider this approach over the fund duplication. Since a lot of baby, they, they might have feeding aversion, those have severe enough to cause severe symptoms, or baby chronic lung that they have some neurological impairment, or they have feeding uh, in a virgin, they might end up gastrostomy placement. And gastrostomy placement, either by the placement of the baby continuous through the endoscopy, we call PIC, or through the, G through the pediatric surgeon, by called by placing G-tube. So you have two kinds of the gastrostomy tube, either done by the uh, pediatric gastroenterologist through the endoscopy, that's called the BIC, or through the pediatric surgeon, um, either laparoscopic or the oven, um, blazing G-tube. And that's usually considered if the baby has neurological impairment, uh, feeding problem, aversion, poor weight gain, and they have the GERD symptoms. Okay? Long-term complication of the GERD, number one, as I said, oral aversion. Very rare when we have the GERD can cause oral aversion. Uh, make sure again, you rule out the other cause before you point your finger to the GERD. Number two, the esophageal can cause esophageal st strictures from the recurrent esophagitis. Now, um, in summary, gastro reflux disease, it's the common, widely we see it. A lot of time we blamed reflux, but the clinical uh, or the really is not reflux related. Uh, almost all premature baby, they will have some degree of the reflux. The, it's very important and the purpose of this presentation to figure out whether baby has a GER or has a GERD need to be treated. The first approach that you treat is non-pharmacological treatment. Number one, small, reduce the overfeeding. If the baby overfeeding, make sure that you reduce the amount. Then you increase the frequency, small infrequent feed or you slow the duration of feed, the baby on the feeding tube, you might consider slow the uh, duration, but always consider or think about uh, that by doing this, you might compromise the baby's nutrition. Positioning, always, we said always on the subine position, we don't recommend brawn or the browning or the lateral position because the risk of sudden infant is higher. If the baby on the formula, uh, you might consider using the thickener formula in the infant term babies or late term preterm baby. 
We don't use it in the tiny premature babies. If you are doubt about the diagnosis, it's worth it to try uh, break down amino acid formula called the hydrolyzed formula, a hypoallergen formula for uh, two to four weeks and see if the symptoms resolve or not. Very rare we, when we required to add medication at this time, it's recommended to involve the GI. At this time, I think I covered uh, everything related to the GERD. Uh, please, if you have any question, feel free to, um, to make comments and I will reply or send me your email. I will send you the explanation. Thank you so much and have a good day.